Three tomatoes are walking down the street. Papa tomato, mama tomato, and baby tomato. Playing catch up presents. Starring Lindsay Inkle and Jamie Nelson. So this is playing catch up, is it? I prefer something with a little more kick. Everybody's favorite condiment themed entertainment podcast. Put some hot sauce on my burrito, baby. <laughs> hot sauce. Nobody. I mean, nobody puts ketchup on a hot dog. You're listening to Hot Sauce on PlainKitchenPodcast.com. I'm Jamie Nelson, and with me, my co-host, Lindsay Hinkle. The theme of the month is science fiction. So, Lindsay, tell me what you've learned about the apocalypse. Sometime in 2010, the Mayan calendar theory really became the most prominent and was really embraced by a lot of people. But before that, um, my friend saw a video online about how the world was going to end in 2012. She's trying to explain it to me. She's like, well, there's this planet called planet X and the orbits like intersect at a certain time. And I'm just staring at her like, why can't they come up with a better name than planet X? So she shows me the website and there is this bearded gentleman in a scientific lab coat. Mm hmm. Looking all official and stuff. And he's talking about Planet X. And there's l- nice little um, animated drawings of how the orbit of Earth and Planet X are going to intersect. And that it's going to happen this year. And that it happened once before. And instead of, you know, us evolving from animals or God creating us, this guy believes that we are a slave race created by Planet X. And last time that Planet X and Earth collided, we, the slaves, hopped off that darn planet. We decided to uh, build a better life for ourselves here. And so now he's saying that this time, when the planets collide in 2012, it's actually going to be a really big collision and all life will end. And it's like, okay, so last time they just kind of bumped and they put out a little bridge and the slaves hopped off. Like, what the hell? As long as we're not being blown up by Vogons, I won't complain. Speaking of which, I'm excited, Lindsay, to open the door to our Skype studio for our special guest this week, Mr. Simon Jones. How are you, Simon? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Great. Good. I saw a few months ago the musical Death Takes a Holiday. Uh Uh-huh. And that was great fun. The only exposure to the story that I've had previously is that I've seen uh, the film Meet Joe Black, which I knew was based on something called Death Takes a Holiday, but I didn't really know what it was. So I was quite surprised that when it ended differently than the film. (laughs) Yes, well, uh, yes, there are two other versions. It started as a play by a man called Alberto Casella in Italian, which was written shortly after the First World War. And uh, there were a lot of plays in that period about uh, people's attitude to death, because after all, the Grim Reaper had been having something of a harvest festival, what with the First World War and the flu epidemic of 1918. So there are, there are a number of plays of this nature. There's, there are plays about people in waiting rooms that turn out to be limbo, uh, outward bound, where all the passengers appear to be on an ocean-going liner, but they're, in fact they're all dead. And um, Death Takes a Holiday was yet another variant. I think the idea from the end of the show, uh, in the play that is, is that now you've met me, you won't be frightened of me when I come for you later. Mm. But that's not not something we actually put across in the musical. The musical was more of a style of Brigadoon. Right. Because when Death actually took human form, he was really more of a sort of chummy leading man, really, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually saw it when the um, the understudy played, but he was really good. Kevin Hurley, yes, he's nerves of steel. He um, had hardly any rehearsal, no put-in with the rest of the cast. Really? You know, which is a rehearsal, of course, with the principals. So the first time we saw him was when he turned up in costume. And this is not a simple part, because every time he was off stage, he was changing into some other outfit. Right. And uh, he'd obviously practiced or had it all in his mind because he didn't bat an eyelid and he appeared to be completely without nerves and sang everything a treat. So he was an object lesson in, if you must understudy, how to do it. I did it once. What was that for? It was for a play called The Clandestine Marriage, directed by Ian McKellen, and it was the last play that uh, Alistair Sim, who is well known over here for the definitive Christmas Carol movie, it was the last play that he did. I had to play his servant, which was my, mostly my job, which was to provide him with the props for a very funny routine of getting up in the morning. Oh. <laughs> but I was also understudying another principal man, and he was ill, and so I had to take over. 
Oh. I was ready, thank goodness, but it's not something I really want to do ever again. You have to sort of imitate what the other person has been doing, otherwise you throw everybody off. Oh, yeah. It didn't take long for Kevin Early to take over the part properly and, and make it his own, and that was fine too, because who was going to argue? Who wants to argue with death? <laughs> yes, exactly. So you played Dario, uh, sort of like the live-in doctor? Yes, in the play he's a corrupt old capitalist, but on, on, on friendly terms, and his character appears to be death. Here I was sort of the voice of elderly, worldly wisdom, and I had my own little romantic subplot with the mother-in-law, who was uh, apparently fairly gaga, and then uh, when death came for a holiday, got her wits back. Uh, we never really found out what happened when death went away again after his holiday was over. I assume we all went back to where we were. Aww. Oh, yeah. So that was a bit sad. So we didn't emphasize that bit. Yeah. So we didn't want everyone to go out feeling miserable. When Peter Morius and said, we can't have a musical with death in the title. And Peter Stone said, well, you emphasize the holiday. You put death in small writing. And in fact, look at the poster. That's exactly what it says. Wow. Yes, I still have to say there were friends who just didn't want to go because they were put off by the title. It is still a great taboo. Well, I think it's a great title. That's probably the intriguing part. You were either intrigued or repelled. There's a, a cast uh, recording now, right? Yes, the CD is out. Yes, indeed. How how was that uh, recorded? Was that were you with any other cast members, or were it just like you and a microphone in a booth? Or no, no, no. We all assembled for a whole day. Oh. At the studio with the orchestra. Unusually, they weren't or um, recorded separately, which is what usually happens on a separate track, and then we sing to it. They were all there, so the whole thing has a certain amount of spontaneity. Oh, wow. But it all had to be right at the same time. And amazingly, it did. And we got it all done in 10 minutes short of the time allotted. So that was pretty good. Wow. Have you done a lot of like professional singing before? Um, I've done some, yes. I do the odd cabaret and we're entertaining people. And uh, I've done a few My Fair Ladies, one in which I had my front teeth knocked out on a stagehand. It's rather put me off doing My Fair Lady again. Oh, was, was that some sort of elaborate stunt or just... No, it was, a, it was a, a deeper blackout than we were led to expect. And I went sauntering off, uh, expecting to come immediately back on again. And I collided with the forehead of a, of a stagehand and knocked out my front teeth. I heard them tinkling on the ground. Ouch. I couldn't actually really go back on again. Least of all to sing I've Grown Accustomed to Her Face when I was actually trying to grow accustomed to my own. <laughs> Oh. My mother and Eliza sat waiting at tea, waiting for me to come on, <coughs> and I never did, sadly. Oh. Rather put me off. But never mind, you know, you wouldn't expect to have that sort of accident in production of My Fair Lady. But... It's not like you were in Spider-Man. <laughs> I know, but you'd think I was. In another production of My Fair Lady, I'm not accident prone, but I crashed into a stagehand at the Paper Mill Playhouse on the dress rehearsal and put my back out for a week, so I wasn't able to open it there either. It's like Macbeth, it's cursed. That must be. I think, I think I've done it now. Would you like to talk about Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Always. For our uh, listeners who may not be aware, in the original radio series as well as the BBC series, you're the protagonist, Arthur Dent. And is it true that Douglas Adams basically wrote the part for you with you in mind? Well, that's what he said. He called me up in 1977, I think it was. We'd been to college together, Cambridge University, and we got to know each other there. And he called me up and I said, said he'd written this uh, science fiction comedy series for radio. And... Uh, Finally, after much hesitation, the BBC uh, commissioners had uh, commissioning editors had, uh, had agreed to go ahead with the pilot. He said uh, I was the only one he could think of. <laughs> As the years have gone by, I think actually he's probably thought I was the only person who could actually do an impersonation of him, because in many ways. As the years have gone by, I've realised that the character of Arthur is much more based on him than it is on me. Huh. Yeah, he's always searching for a decent cup of tea. Spends a lot of time in the bath. Panics easily. Um. Yeah, I can't quite keep up with time. Um, I always thought rather similar to, to Douglas rather than to me. Though, I mean, we have similarities, it has to be said. I think an argument could be made the other way as well. But uh, so we did um, a radio pilot in 1977. God, that long ago. And the BBC commission, the commissioning editors had no idea what it was about, but they said to the producer, well, if you think it's funny, you'd better go and do a series. So we did. Uh, the series was written as we went, so we had no idea how it was going to end, and nor did Douglas. But somehow or other, with sh odd sheets of paper, we finally finished the first series. It was put out because the BBC still didn't have quite enough faith in it at the unusual time of 10.30pm on a Tuesday night. Mm. They're hoping to cover their bets. If it was a complete failure, then nobody would notice. As they say now, if they wanted to build up a cult, that was a way of doing it too. Yeah. Well, the latter is what happened. People were, for some reason or another, as they tend to be more so in England, tuned into the radio. 
um, even at that hour. Sometimes you're listening to the news or making cocoa or putting the cat out or going to bed. And uh, people were intrigued, even if they picked up on the second or third episodes. And for the first and only time, I believe, in BBC history, uh, they were forced by public um, pressure to repeat it immediately. So that's when people began to realize that there was something interesting going on here. People were seeing beyond the science fiction and seeing the satire of bureaucracy and, uh, and the cleverness of the jokes. Of course, all these years later, there are so many parts of it that are part of the, uh, of the language. It's not even really over yet. Do you want to tell people about the upcoming stuff? Well, absolutely. I mean, there are, of course, so many media. Well, having done the radio series, which is how it started, Douglas was prevailed upon to uh, write a novelization. And he wrote two, and then he wrote three more in what he called his trilogy, which had five books in it. But that's, that was sufficiently odd to go with the rest of them. And uh, though the story has varied considerably from what we were doing on the radio, uh, nonetheless, uh, they were extremely well sold, bestsellers. And so it became inevitable that we should do a TV series. So the BBC pooled their resources and we did a television series with what we thought was the height of uh, technological achievement for 1979-80. And everyone was rather, rather gobsmacked in uh, England as to how sophisticated it looked. It was only when I came over here and was uh, promoting it for its uh, broadcast in this country that uh, I suddenly realized that part of its appeal was that it looked so tacky. <laughs> and I had to do a quick soft shoe shuffle and say, well, of course, that was entirely intentional. I, I love the, uh, the TV series. I think it was the first... Thing that I was in elementary school, and before I'd heard the radio series, before I'd read the books, uh, I had the TV series on VHS. And as kids do, I watched it over and over and over until I knew all of the lines. That's right. And people still do. Yeah. Douglas's main ambition after that was to write other things uh, and also to get a book film made, which he spent an awful lot of time and, and perhaps looking back on it wasted a lot of time in trying to get it made but it was eventually made after he died in fact one should add that he died sadly at the age of 49 in 2001 ridiculous time to to go and he, uh, he was working out in the gym which has confirmed all my worst beliefs about gyms but the film was made thereafter and we also decided that we must do the other radio the other three books as a radio series because it had started as radio and under radio it should return mm -hmm. So we kept chugging along, doing bits and pieces. And, uh, then recently, uh, Penguin Books, we're going to um, publish um, uh, yet another sequel written by Owen Colfer. Oh, yes. Called And Another Thing. And there was only one person they thought who could write any more, The Hitchhiker's Guide, and there were lots of people who thought it shouldn't be done at all. But uh, Douglas's agent and the family thought, well, why not have a go? It's actually a very funny book. Very good. Very much in the style of Douglas. Yeah, I enjoyed it. And we hope to make a radio series using the original cast. Because why not? But in order to launch it, we had this huge thing called Hitchcon 2009. Well, we called it huge. It was at the Royal Festival Hall on the South Bank of Thames in London. And there was an exhibition of Douglas's memorabilia, including his bath, which uh, his widow Jane had taken out of a bath she was converting. Wow. And it is extra long, so people were able to admire, you know, the sort of bath that a six foot five person could actually lie in the universe in. And, uh, there were various autograph sessions, and there was a lecture from Owen Colfer, and there were readings of his book. And it culminated on the Saturday night with a live show with the original cast. A row of microphones, we had our scripts, there was um, live sound effects, and a band behind, and, uh, and a screen for various projections and, and lighting. And we thought that was about as much as we ought to do, given the fact that it's radio. And it's still a radio experience, even if they're watching it live. Right. And there were 2,000 people from all over Europe, and they were turning people away. Wow. And it was like a rock concert. Every time we mentioned one of your favorite lines, it was sort of a cheer and a roar. And we came away from this thinking, hmm, there's more to be done with this. Maybe we should take it out on a national tour. And so in June, in 2012, we will be doing a uh, tour of the UK, doing about 15 cities in about five weeks, two nights at each city. Not leave them, not leave them still wanting a bit more. You know? And we'll see how that goes. And if it goes well, we'll uh, we'll do yet another one in the fall. Apparently, there's a massive enthusiasm, and uh, people are falling over themselves to uh, to contribute to it. Mm. And uh, we've had the original cast so far. What's the name list of everyone who's on the tour then? Well, there'll be me, and there'll be Jeff McGiven as Ford Prefect, and 
Susan Sheridan as uh, Trillian, and Mark Wing Davy, uh, who's currently a professor of drama at NYU, so we have to fit it in at the end of his semester, uh, as Seyfold Bieberbrox, and Stephen Moore as the uh, as Marvin, the paranoid android, the depressed robot. That was one of the loudest laughs of the evening, and he came in and said, I want you all to know I'm feeling really depressed. <laughs> the audience went mad again, because of course it was one of their favorite lines. What we did discover was that we really mustn't change the inflections. People remembered it as they remembered lyrics from a song. However many years have gone by and how much experience we may have, we may want to tweak the emphasis of a line or anything, we've decided that we aren't going to do that. We're going to do it exactly as people heard it. And because most of the pleasure people derive from it is actually just seeing people, human beings, delivering lines they've only ever heard out of a radio, you know what I mean? That makes sense, yeah. What we, what we do intend to do as, a, as an unusual twist is to um, record each, each performance individually. Really? Put it on a memory stick and uh, offer them for sale at the end so that uh, each individual show will be an individual show. If somebody has a loud braying laugh, which uh, annoyed everybody, they'll be able to do it again. If we do some strange ad lib or somebody drops something or falls off the stage, they'll be able to hear it again. And we figure this is our tribute to, uh, to the fact that it started as radio and finishes as radio. You will go and see it being recorded, so to speak, and then you'll have it as a souvenir thereafter. Wow. That's cool. Is it the just the first season, or is it like an abridged of everything, or how far does it go? The first half is largely your greatest hits, so to speak. Okay. And then, uh, and then we're bringing in the material from the uh, from the other th- the other three series we did uh, in the in the what do we call them the noughties in the two thousands. <laughs> yeah. So and 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 that'll be fun. We're also going to have Douglas appearing because uh, he, as you may well know, uh, did do an audio version of all the books himself reading. Oh yeah. Yeah. And he played a character called Agrajag. Oh, yes. An enraged creature who always seems to be being killed by ac- totally by accident by um, Arthur, wherever he goes, in whatever dimension. And he builds a temple of hate, determined to, uh, to destroy Arthur. And, of course, in the end, sadly destroys himself. But we were able to take uh, his reading of the dialogue of Agrajag, and I can perform with it. Wow. And so we have the voice of Douglas and, uh, and a flapping umbrella. For the bat? Bat-like figure follow me around and that's how that scene plays out and so you actually get you know, the author's voice which is great fun performing i just love doing that because you know it's almost as though he's still with us mm. so is that like in the cave scene yeah, that's exactly it in the temple of hate yes someone's put up on a uh, youtube some sort of version of it they've taken the audio of that scene from the radio show and then they've put various pictures over the top of it and it's they called it something like the the halloween version of hitchhiker's guy yeah look it up all right then make a quick note of that i don't suppose there's any plans to bring it to new york uh well that remains to be seen we first of all we see how we go in uh, in england sure. um, and then we'll um well, then we explore the possibility with those people who own the rights as to uh, where to go next but at the moment it's it's restricted to the uk mm-hmm but I think if it's any way successful, I'm sure they'll be very happy to uh, to move it along. Is there going to be like live foley or anything? Yes, yes, absolutely. You'll see it all being done before your very eyes, which is all the fun, and and the rock group, the you know, playing the music, the traditional music behind. Wow! And there will be screen projections. And, uh, you know, we want to, we want to make it as uh, as much of a happening as possible without actually overstaging it. You know what I mean? Because people are really just coming to hear it. Yeah. Here and see it, put the two together. It's, it's amazing how all these years later, it's still um, providing me with something to do, among the other things that I do. Yeah, I was going to say, are you uh, are you sick of it yet, the huge franchise, or are you still embracing it? I used to say I had a, you know, a great future behind me. Yeah. Just about the same time, I did a TV series for Granada called Brideshead Revisited, which became an enormous hit on both sides of the Atlantic. And, uh, I played Bridie, the eldest brother. And the two of them were enormously uh, useful credentials when I came over to uh, America first, because people had seen them. I could have done TV series that lasted for 20 years in, in England, but nobody would have seen them in America, and it wouldn't have made any difference. But they'd seen them, and they knew them. And so I was able to get going straight away. And uh, as I say, I used to say I had a great future behind me with those two. But uh, you know, they, they don't give up. While we still have life in our bodies, we shall go on doing The Hitchhiker. Because after all, our voices haven't changed. Apparently, they haven't at all. And Dirk, the producer, actually measured it from the first episode uh, to the last series we were doing, and, and we sound the same. First of all, he said I was half a decibel higher. You know, you get old, your voice gets higher. Huh. Older. But then he said, actually, no. He, he came back to me later and said, no, I had, it, uh, I had it slightly on the wrong speed. You're exactly the same. Oh, wow. Which only goes to show, well, voices don't change that much. Yeah, that's interesting. Do you have any sort of... Um 
like rituals or like things that you do eat or don't eat or warm up for doing voice acting? When I'm reading an audio book or something and it's just me in the studio, then I usually have a large plate of oatmeal to begin with. But I'm not particularly fond of oatmeal normally. It's in fact the only time I have it. It's just before I have to record anything at great length to avoid that symphony of sound that usually comes from an empty stomach. Ah. If you could play the voice of any character ever throughout the history of storytelling, who would you play? Yeah, that's a real tricky question, isn't it? I think I'd like to play, actually, because in a way I have done it already, I'd probably like to play Bartimaeus the Demon in the Bartimaeus trilogy by Jonathan Stroud, which it cries out to be made into a movie. Oh. I didn't know anything about it until I was given the script and asked to read it as an audio version. Jonathan Stroud had worked for a long time as a publisher and clearly knew his stuff. It's post-Harry Potter. Um, it does concern magic, but magic as a, as a corrupt arm of politics, which is kind of interesting. Hmm. It's set in a strange Neverland London. A young 11-year-old boy is apprenticed as a, as a magician, and obviously in the corridors of power. It has lots to say about social stratification. And uh, he, summons, uh, he dares to summon up a demon from beyond called Bartimaeus, who is wonderfully sarcastic and, and snide. And uh, the book is full of wonderful footnotes where he occasionally changes his mind and feels he has to explain a little more his attitude towards human beings, who he generally despises. But, uh, you know, if they know the right magic, they can become, he, he has to be their slave. And it really annoys the hell out of him. And, uh, of course, he can see through various planes. So, uh, whereas you and I may not see the other demons, where, you know, if you, if, you, if you have the power, you can see what they really are like on other planes. Mainly it's to do with awful, awful political skullduggery and, and corruption. And it's, it's very funny indeed. Huh. And, and there are three of them. And uh, he's just done a prequel, which I've also had the pleasure of recording, called The Ring of Solomon. Bartimaeus and the, uh, oh, that's the Samarkand, the Amulet of Samarkand, that's right. And then there are two others, and then uh, the Ring of Solomon. Um, excellent books. I'll have to look those up. Yes, do. Jonathan Stroud. How did you get involved uh, when you did the Terry Gilliam films? I love Brazil and Twelve Monkeys. Terry Gilliam is one of my favorite directors. Well, I did a film called uh, Privates on Parade, based on a stage play that I'd done successfully in the West End of London, starting at the Royal Shakespeare Company, and then subsequently uh, at the Piccadilly Theatre, the late Dennis Quilly and Nigel Hawthorne. It was uh, basically uh, the playwright Peter Nichols's recollections of national service in Malaya in what was called the Emergency of 1947. They called it an emergency, so they, couldn't call, they didn't have to call it a war. All sorts of luckless conscriptees were sent off to, uh, to fight. And uh, Peter Nichols lucked out and joined an entertainment troupe, which produced many subsequent very, um, very popular entertainers uh, in England, including Kenneth Williams and Stanley Baxter, uh, neither of whom you may have heard of, but were very popular in England. And was set, set in the steamy jungles of Malaya. Well, we filmed it in, some, in a forest in Farnham in South, the Surrey, uh, because the budget wouldn't allow us to go to Singapore. Uh-huh. I thought it looked fairly convincing. Um, it was directed by the same stage director, Michael Blakemore, but they insisted that Nigel Hawthorne, who I might point out went on to get an Oscar nomination for The Madness of King George, was considered not box office enough, so they swapped him with uh, John Cleese, which is a short-term cure, I think. But uh, So I spent a lot of time with him, because filming is fairly boring work. Uh, the result may be glamorous, but the actual process is extraordinarily dreary when you only do a few minutes at a time, and then everything has to be relit, and you have to sit sit around and wait for that to be done, and then do the same thing again from a different angle. Sure. So I'm not saying it's coal mining, but it's not particularly interesting, right. unless you have amusing company. And please and I would chatter away about this, that, and the other, and at the end of filming, he said, I think we've got a few more things we need to talk about. Why don't you join me and the rest of the Pythons in, uh, in the meaning of life? You know, where there are seven people, and there are only six of us, including when we play women. <laughs> oh, I was delighted. So I, I got a couple of scenes out of that, went off. That's why I actually met my wife, who was the American manager of the Monty Pythons at that time. Oh, really? And so uh, I made a couple of scenes. Death comes to dinner. Yes, I know that one. Mortal lines like, shall we take our cars? <laughs> I think that's supposed to be married to Terry Jones. And I do also have to report that Graham Chapman had his leg chewed off by a tiger. And then subsequently, um, yes, uh, Brazil first and then 12 monkeys. Yeah. Working with Gilliam is not the most comfortable thing to do. Twelve Monkeys, we were, we were, for some reason, as those rather strange boffins that we were, we had to wear these sort of Japanese-like shoes with huge soles, like sort of uh, flip-flops, but you couldn't flip-flop in them. I think they, I always maintained they were to prevent us from running away from the film set. I was going to say, I don't think you ever really see your feet. We never see our feet. That was the annoying thing. <laughs> We couldn't run away. And we were in these freezing uh, power stations in, uh, you know, power generating plants in um, 
Philadelphia. Is that where that was? And they were ghastly cold. And I felt particularly sorry for Bruce Willis, actually, because he, he apparently went into the future with nothing on at all. Really chilly. But uh, anyway, Brazil seems to be getting more and more um, prophetic, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I hope 12 Monkeys doesn't become too prophetic. <laughs> yes, let's hope not. You know, he has a grim, apocalyptic view of the future with Victorian plumbing. I love that, though, because I feel like Whenever I say something looks Brazilian, I'm not referring to the country. I'm usually referring to the fact that something has really neat ductwork. <laughs> exactly. I know exactly what you mean. Yes. So uh, I became friends with them over the years. And recently, my wife Nancy was the subject of, um, with, along with Terry Gilliam and Michael Palin, of a new play that was performed at the Hampstead Theatre Club in London, so which I had to go over and see. Oh, what's that? It was called No Naughty Bits. Hmm by Steve Thompson. It was about what turned out to be a landmark case to do with writers, you know, their rights to protect their work from other people mauling it around. It was back in 1974, I think it was, unbeknownst to the Pythons, the BBC sold through an agent, I think it was Time Life, to ABC, the last series, the one they did without John Cleese, to be made into two 90-minute specials to be shown late night. I mean, they were already on, so they were quite well known in America, and they were rather appalled when they saw the result. Because, of course, when you do a 90-minute commercial special, that's not three programs of 30 minutes, because 24 minutes are taken up with commercials. Right. So they set about it with scissors to make complete nonsense of several of the sketches, but also did um, various... Uh, um, strange pieces of censoring, like, for example, when the Flying Montgolfier brothers got up in the morning, they washed their hands, faces, and naughty bits, and they bleeped the words naughty bits. <laughs> which not only took away the element of silliness, which was obviously the intention, but also made it sound infinitely worse. Huh. This they didn't quite understand. They felt a responsibility that, you know, because the television was now something that was, uh, well, they, they described it as a known and trusted friend in the corner of the sitting room. They were duty-bound not to send anything too shocking down the airwaves. I think that's something that still pervades, like the way they pixelate people's buttocks whenever you see them. The extraordinary thing to see, <laughs> even now. As if that was sort of arousing or provocative or outrageous. Anyway, be that as it may, um, there was a court case, and um, Terry Gilliam and Michael Bailey and Nancy had to testify. The judge was a rather brilliant man called uh, Judge Morris Lasker, who recently died in his 90s. Some of the wittiest lines in the play are, in fact, taken directly from the transcript of his very wry comments. Really? And uh, it was actually great fun. And it did turn out to be a, a very important landmark case, because while ABC had in good faith bought these programs and didn't know there were these conditions, and it would have done them material harm not to be able to show the, uh, the second one. <clears throat> they were strongly advised to appeal, and they did, and uh, worldwide rights then reverted to the Monty Pythons and were taken away from the BBC. So they have worldwide control over their writing, um, and any uh, broadcast of it worldwide becomes theirs. Huh. Uh, people can find you on simonjonesinfo.com. Yep. And are you doing the Facebook or the Twitter thing? Going, we're certainly going to have a, a Twitter feed going on from the Hitchhiker's Tour. Possibly a diary of where we're going and what we're doing. All right. Well, everyone should go and pick up the uh, soundtrack to Death Takes Holiday. Yeah, you bet. And uh, thanks so much for joining me. Not at all. Thank you, Jamie. Have a good rest of your Sunday. Thank you, thank you. Take care. Yeah, you too. Bye. This has been Hot Sauce, brought to you by PlainCatchupPodcast.com. Please subscribe, rate, and comment on iTunes. Check back every Monday for a new celebrity guest interview. You may also want to check out our hilarious Wednesday videos on YouTube.com slash PlainCatchup. That's P-L-A-I-N-K-E-T-C-H-U-P. Sign up for our newsletter on PlainCatchupPodcast.com to be entered into our monthly drawings. We give away t-shirts, music, stickers, and more from our guests. Please like us on Facebook.com slash Plain Ketchup and follow us on Twitter at Plain Ketchup. Don't forget to support this project by buying Plain Ketchup swag at our Cafe Press store. Have a question? Email Jamie and Lindsay at gmail.com. That's J-A-I-M-E and L-I-N-D-S-E-Y at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Stay saucy. I thought playing catch-up was trying to get hold of people on the phone. <laughs>